you know, this idea of God as the, the cosmic buzzkill, where all he just loves to ruin your good time by saying, no, 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 it's just restriction. The idea is those no's are not no for no sake, but there are no that's supposed to point you to a yes. And the yes, when you, when you surrender to it, is then, you know, it's going to lead to human flourishing is the idea. Hello, and welcome to Unsafe Space with Carter and Carrie. Today, we are honored to get to interview a man that I've come to know in the past few months who I really look up to. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I'm going to let Carter do the bio, and then I'll say my hellos. Uh, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk to Bradley Helgerson. Bradley serves as the Minister of the Word for the Church on the Square in Georgetown, Texas. He's also a PhD candidate in Church and Dogma History at Northwest University. You can find his teachings at the Church on the Square's YouTube channel and Facebook page. We'll put links to both the YouTube channel and the Facebook page in the show notes below. Uh, and with that, Bradley, welcome to Unsafe Space. Thanks for joining. Hey, thank you. I'm honored to be on your show, really. Bradley. So Bradley's my preacher, guys, and he is a pretty cool preacher. <laughs> I just have to say, I'm so grateful that I met you, that I found the Church on the Square. I randomly, I can't remember how I found it, but I, the very first service, I went in and I had been looking for a church for a while, and I've spent some time at different ones, and uh, you, I had found this cowboy church I was going to for a while that I, I liked, but it more, I would say, fed my heart, and whereas your services feed my heart and my head, you're super geeky preacher in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that I, I feed your mind, not you your feed heart. My mind. Sort of like cold rationalism, you know. Both. Uh, my mind. No, okay. Yeah, Great. my heart and my mind. It's amazing. Yeah. This is why Carrie thinks that I will enjoy this conversation because I'm also geeky, apparent, according to yes. Carrie. Uh, but yeah, I have to good. say, yeah. the fact that you can compete with cowboy, uh, a cowboy church, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that is. Uh, I might put that on my bio in the future. That, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I have actually never been to a cowboy church, and I don't really know much about them. But um, I would imagine ours is pretty different. Uh, yeah, it was very so, different. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you tell us a little bit? I know we have. Uh, there's a sermon today you gave that I found really fascinating that I'd love to talk about. Um, but first, can you walk us a, a little bit through your story of how you came to be a pastor? Because I think you probably have an interesting evolution. Yeah, so I grew up in um, a Catholic home. My parents were Catholic. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. But it was a pretty nominal form of Catholicism. It was sort of like humanism with a Catholic veneer. Um, and so we looked highly upon the Western canon, but we look with suspicion upon revelatory texts. And so um, in my father's two-story library, there was a Bible in there somewhere, but I was, you know, I didn't know where it was, and I was never asked to go fetch it. So scripture was not really a part of my upbringing. I mean, I, I even joke, I had 12 years of Catholic school uh, where I had an hour of religion every day, and I don't remember ever once opening the Bible. So wow. um, that's what when I was saying. When you say it, it was, revelatory text, you mean the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, scripture. That's right. So, you know, we were we believed in great books, you know, the Western canon and and in the importance of a liberal education and, and, and all of that was exalted. My my parents were trained by Jesuits, both their undergraduate and graduate uh, background. So, um, I mean, that's, you know, sort of at least their take on it was, you know, that the scripture was. Um, for the most part, a man-made book, and it has some wisdom in it, but it, it wasn't viewed in the way that I view the Bible Bible now. Um, so I remember as a child having a very innocent and strong faith. I believed in God, and I would uh, earnestly pray to Him when I was you know, afraid or um, anxious about something. And, and to be honest, I really felt it, his, his presence in a, in a very powerful way when I would pray to Him as a child. Uh, but over time, it's, you know, it's 
Tom Holland talks about the losing of his faith as sort of just turning down the dimmer switch. And I, I, I really identify with that. As, as time goes on, that relationship with God just receded into the background. I, to be honest, as I got older, I just didn't think about it very much. and It wasn't fostered. So it just sort of went away. And then, you know, when I went to college, I started to think about it a little bit more. And I thought, OK, well, I think I'm a I think I'm an agnostic. You know, I, I don't know. Being an atheist at the time, at least I felt like that was making a truth claim that, you know, that I knew something that there is no God. And so I felt like I didn't have good enough evidence for that. So it was safer to say I'm an agnostic. And, um, you know, I went to school in upstate New York and everybody was an agnostic or an atheist, or at least everybody I knew. And then I went to graduate school uh, down in Texas, and I met my wife, who was, um, we used to say, a, an out-of-duty Christian. She grew up as a Christian, and she, <laughs> she's not completely fallen away, but she, I mean, the fact that she started dating me was a, you know, a sign that she was, uh, you know, out of duty, because um, <laughs> I'd become, um, well, I, I won't talk about that, but anyway, um, and really, the, the, the sort of the journey back to faith was um, I, I, Clay Rutledge, the um, behavioral um, scientist, talks about how some people have everybody has a need for meaning in their life, but some people for some people it's more acute than for others. I, it seems that I'm way on the side of you know needing meaning, and that it's very acute for me. And after I got out of sort of you know my early 20s, I started to look around and, 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 and realized I really needed some, something that gave my life meaning, purpose, and, and value in a substantive way. Um, and when it came to Christianity, I was sort of inoculated to it, right? I felt like, okay, well, I already know all about that because I grew up Catholic. And so that was just off the list. It wasn't even a live option for me. And so I started to explore many other things, looking for this kind of meaning. And as the journey progressed, I became more and more desperate. It just, the world became darker and darker. Um, you know, sort of the, the nihilism of my current worldview really began to crush me. I mean, it really began to crush me. I really, it really became very dark in my own mind. Um, and so sort of long story short is eventually I got to a point where I tried everything I could think to try, explored every worldview I could think. And finally, just out of desperation, you know, with absolutely no expectation that reading the Bible would offer me anything, I turned to scripture. At that point, my wife had already come back to the church and she was attending. And uh, so she was encouraging me to at least give it a try and to read the text of scripture. And just, it was just absolute desperation. And I started to read it, in particular to read the Gospels and to really try to get to know who this Jesus is that, that's mm -hmm. been so influential. And that was really it. It's about a six-month journey um, of, of shifting of my worldview, of a transition. But it was really coming to know the person of Jesus in the text of Scripture that I found to be most pivotal in, in, in me making that transition. I, You know, I felt like he knew me, right? He knew the the deep darkness in my heart. He knew he. It, there was just this sense from Scripture that it knew who I was and it knew what I needed, and so that really resonated with me. And um, you know, and as I said, it's a six month journey to that. It makes it sound like it was instantaneous, and it wasn't. It was a, it was a long journey there. But as soon as I was converted, I felt a call to preach. And so there was a period of sort of training that was, you know, that I had to go through and all that. And then I just started preaching and I've been preaching ever since. So. So how did you go from how did you transition from. Because um, you, you already had the mindset, it sounds like growing up from your parents of this was just a book written by some people. And maybe there's some insights in it that were passed along through stories. How did you go from that to, oh, I, I believe in the mysticism of the Bible as well now. Like I've, I've, I am actually a believer. I don't just view it as a version of Homer or some other ancient text, but it's, it's something unique and special because I, I hear that you read it, but then my mind got lost on the, the jump from, from appreciating it to having faith. You know, I, 
I mean, maybe this is because I'm a modern person. I wish I could say that it was arguments that got me there, you know, like I got into apologetics and I, you know, looked at all the evidence for why we should trust the scriptures and all of that. It wasn't actually any of those uh, things. Um, in fact, my interest in apologetics has come after becoming a Christian much more so than before. I, I just wasn't really interested. I guess I was so desperate to find deep meaning that I, you know, that aspect of it, which, you know, uh, is is a reality and it has to be dealt with at some point, right? Because I, I don't want to believe something that's false and a fantasy and all that. But my motive, my reasoning was motivated, right? So um, really, as I said, I think it was, it, it, it just, as I read it, 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 to me, it had so much credibility. Um, I, you know, like the reading the Apostle Paul, for example, which I would say, you know, most historians are going to say that, you know, at least some of Paul's writings are historical. He was a real person, um, you know, that had a real radical change of life. And, you know, the, the idea that this person could be deceiving me and yet at the same time be teaching what, what I was finding to be very profound ethical teaching and just just profound philosophical and theological teaching just didn't seem to make sense to me right it seemed it seemed authentic and um i guess that's you know that was really it for me is it just it just had a, a ring of truth to it and and so that was enough at that point to say you know this um and again the the pressure that was upon me as a Christian, I would say God was putting this pressure on me, right. So that I could see the truth of scripture, but the pressure on me was significant. So I was ready to surrender to something, right. Maybe surrender my life. I mean, to be honest. And, um, this really spoke to me on a deep level. And so again, like I say, I wish I could say it was, you know, it was cold hard reason. And I really sat back and said, um, you know, from the balcony, viewing all the evidence and weighing it in an unbiased way, and um, which I've come to think that that's that has to be a part of it, right? It has to the myth has to be fact, um, but at least for me, I think that's secondary, and I know that's a that's a that's a sin in you know, or at least it used to be in the, in the modern world to to say that that those kinds of things are secondary to me, but that's just the truth of it. I think I know kind of what you mean because Carter and I've talked about on the show before that well I believe in other ways of knowing beyond just reason and logic right. but we don't yeah. use those we don't assume those other ways of knowing when we talk to guests or when we try to uh, have rational conversations with one another I would never tell Carter well you're wrong and I just know it from you know my spiritual place like I just don't ha I don't base arguments there but I do believe in other ways of knowing, and I can't, it's, it's, it's interesting for me to hear you say, you wish you could say it was about arguments because I often feel the same way. It's like, I can't really explain why I believe what I believe now. I just do. I feel like God spoke to me a few times and I can't even really explain what that was like. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was in, it was like touching me in a way that I felt like I understood things. And, right. and not in a rational way. Right. And and I have atheist friends, not Carter, because Carter's very um, uh, considerate as towards and very charitable towards Christians. And I have another atheist friend who's very argumentative with me. And he insists that it's I've just had some type of um, chemical in the mind, some type of euphoric experience that science right. can't explain. Well, okay, I don't care if he believes that. I don't believe that, but I understand that it's a perfectly reasonable thing to believe. So it doesn't bother me that he thinks that. Um, well, you know, it, it, in, with regards to the other ways of knowing, right, I think it's, it's kind of like if you went into an art gallery and you saw a beautiful painting, right, there's a, you know, on, on a level of intuition, right? It's not that you, most of the time, sort of stop yourself and say, okay, let me analyze the painting and break it into pieces and, and try to, you know, there's no, there's not a deliberative component to it where I'm trying to think through why, why this painting or whether or not it's beautiful, right? You just have an immediate reaction to it, right? Our aesthetic judgment is almost like a perception. It's like aesthetic perception. It's like when I look out the window and I see a tree, I automatically think tree. Oftentimes with aesthetic judgment, it's like that. It's, 
we just get an immediate uh, sense that this is something beautiful or this is something that's ugly. Um, now, of course, that sense is trained through, you know, the social imaginary, through, through your worldview. Um, but I think moral perception works in a similar way. And so it's, I think we had, there's been a long period of time where this kind of knowing has been dismissed as just, you know, meaningless and it's, and it's just about cold hard reason. But that's just not true for the vast majority of our experience throughout the day, right? We're just, we're, we're working on what um, Aristotle would call the habitus, right? It's just sort of this, these, an instinctual interaction with the world. And I think those things have real merit. I mean, I think the imagination is a capacity that we have versus reason. Reason sort of breaks all of these, you know, breaks something down into pieces and analyzes them. But imagination is the ability to put them together, right? So if you were to look at a waterfall, you could sort of break down all the pieces of it. If you stood, you know, um, in Zimbabwe um, at uh, the, the, you know, the great waterfall that's there, um, Victoria Falls, which is one of the marvels of, of the world, you could, in a very cold way, break it down to, you know, how far the water is dropping and how many gallons and all this stuff. But we have this capacity to put that all together and to see beauty in it, right, which creates wonder and awe. And I guess that's what I'm saying is when I looked at the, read the text of Scripture, that was, that was the kind of knowledge I was receiving, right? It's, it's not, you know, you could break the waterfall down into all those pieces, but you're not really seeing the waterfall, right? It's, it's like C.S. Lewis's article on— um, the, what is it? The uh, meditations in a woodshed, right? Where he's he's in a woodshed and this a beam of light is coming in, and he's saying that reason is looking at the beam of light and breaking it down to the physics and all of its parts or whatever. That's one way of knowing. But then you can also stand, right, and face the beam, stand in it and see it, um, where you see the beauty of it and you experience. So there's an experiential kind of knowledge as well. So. What that means then is because that's what I'm seeing in Scripture and I'm experiencing through worship and other things, I can't argue, use that to argue really with Carter to say, you need to believe in Christianity because of my <laughs> own experience with the divine, right, with the transcendent. But what I could do is he may have some defeater beliefs where he thinks, you know, Christianity is impossible. So I'm, it's not even a live option for him like it wasn't for me. He might be inoculated uh, to it, right? He, he received, you know, some some dose of it when he was young, and oh, he got a big dose. Up. He did a good big dose. Let me guess. <laughs> Let me guess. Maybe I'm off about this, but it was hyper legalism, right? Just hardcore. Is that right or no? Uh, no, but it, in fairness, there's no way you could have guessed about my childhood experience with Christianity. It was uh, off. It was on the tail end of a bell curve somewhere, but. Uh, I, I did read the Bible probably six or seven times when I was young. Um, so, uh, but anyway, I, I don't mean to interrupt. You can, you well, I was can just going to say that you, you may have some defeater beliefs that I could, I, I don't even, you know, I could just sort of maybe undermine a little bit to, to make Christianity a live option again. And then, then what I would say is, okay, now you, you know, come in, you know, and experience worship and start praying and, in reading the scriptures in that way um, would be the path that, that I, would, I would try to take him down, right? It's not where I'm going to, you know, strong arm you and prove you it's true. Um, <laughs> because the other thing I think is, is, is what we do, what we do. I don't think we actually have control over the, the things that we believe in a direct sense, right? Control over assent. Um, what philosophers call direct docastic voluntarism, which is, is to say, I can't will to believe something in an automatic way, right? Belief seems to be, um, uh, you know, just a, a automatic response to what it, you know, what you deem is sufficient evidence for something, what you perceive to be evidence, because it might not actually be evidence. It's kind of like, um, like blushing, right? You blush, you don't, you don't have direct control. You can't just tell yourself blush and you blush like you tell yourself to raise your arm. You have to put yourself in a situation where there's a, a sufficient amount of embarrassment, and then that's the natural reaction to it. I think that belief, assent is similar to that. The truth is, or belief is directed at truth, and there has to be sufficient evidence, and it's automatic. 
So I don't think you can will it, but what you can will, what you do have control over is sort of managerial control, right? So somebody presents evidence, I begin to assent to it, and then I can suppress the truth and unrighteousness at that point, right? And I can, I can engage in, in, in focusing my attention on counter evidence and, you know, and in, in the backfire effect and all, all the rest of it. So it seems to me that just, and I'm going get, to get, get, you know, killed by, by Christians for saying things like this. So, well, I mean, here we go. But it, it's rather than just spending all of our time reasoning back and forth with, with arguments, uh, what I found is when you do that, even if you bring a good argument, if the person doesn't want to believe that it's true, they'll just suppress yeah. it anyway. It gets you nowhere. Yeah. In other words, you have to convince them of the value of believing it. Otherwise, most of the time you're going to get nowhere because most people are not cold rationalists who look at these things in a disinterested way. And they're just going to say, OK, you know, I'm, I'm going to be very neutral about this. If you give me sufficient evidence, I'll believe it, especially when you're talking about these you know, foundational beliefs, because the consequences are huge. Right. So if I talk to someone about belief, one of the first questions I ask them, maybe the first question is, is well, do you want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Right. Um, because if they say, well, first of all, they say, well, it doesn't really matter to me whether Jesus is the Messiah or not. I have you know, no dog in that hunt. I don't believe them. Right. Or or maybe they don't know who Jesus claimed to be. But if Jesus is who the prophets said he, that he was, that he's king of kings and Lord of lords. Right. That he's that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess his kingship, that if he is king, then every thought you have is to t- be taken captive to him. I mean, the consequences of Jesus being the Messiah are gigantic. Right. So they're going to radically change your life, whether or not it's true. So I guess I don't believe it, it may be that they don't understand the, the consequences of what I'm asking them. But, you know, if, if you were to ask somebody, well, does it matter to you whether you have terminal cancer? You know, they're going to say, well, yeah, I, I don't want to have terminal cancer. So these big fundamental questions, people have a vested interest. They either want to believe them or they don't want to believe them. So it seems to me that if I'm going to get anywhere with someone, I first have to make them think that believing it is a good thing, like it has value, which is to say, I have to give them a vision of, of, you know, of it, so that they can see its value. I got to, I got to show them, give them a glimpse of the beauty of believing it, of, you know, the vision of the good life that Christianity has to offer. And for them to say, you know, wow, that would be cool if it were true. If right? it were true. I like if that. If it were true. Yeah. You know? And that then, then that what it tells you is, okay, they have some defeater beliefs that make it impossible for them to believe, and then you try to undermine those. And again, just trying to get them to move in that direction. So, see, you know, it seems to me that, um, and this is true of any any disagreement you have somebody with somebody if it's issues that matter. Is you have to, you know, if they have a vested interest, you're going to have to demonstrate to them that it's worth believing your side, that it has value. Otherwise. I mean, it, the discussion is interminable. You could give them a great argument. Because here's the other thing with these arguments, especially when it comes to this and another thing I'll get killed for, but especially when it comes to God's existence, there's a way to wiggle out of, out of all of them, right? I mean, there's always a way to um, reject them in your mind and say, okay, well, you know, it's the probability is, is, is below 0.5 or, you know, it's certainly not certain. And, and there's always a way to kind of wiggle out of them. So, the best thing to do is to first convince someone it's a value and then move on. So there's a lot, there's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, I, it's okay. There, there's a lot in there. Um, and I, I do feel the need to defend reason just for a moment. Um, okay, sure. Because, uh, I don't, I don't view reason. So I, there's, there's some things I agree with in there, which is, um, you know, you talked about looking at art, there's an instantaneous kind of evaluation that is, um, we'll say emotional, psychological evaluation of the art, right? And But we do know that that is based, as you mentioned, on your worldview. It is based on things that you've um, perceived and decided upon uh, in your life. So so that's fine. Um, I, I, think, I think when a lot of people use reason, they, they mischaracterize reason as a belief that we run around making conscious, rational calculations about everything, and that's the way to be rational. Um, Intuition is not irrational. Intuition is giving you valid data 
about your own emotions. And that data is only as reliable as your own expertise and emotions or experiences would 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 allow it to be. So if I'm a if I've spent 30 years as an art critic and I look at a painting and I feel like it's a fake, well, my emotion actually might have some maybe that should be investigated because there's re, there's actual rational reason to believe that my emotional evaluation has credibility because it's been I've been training my subconscious for decades to be able to identify those things. Whereas someone who has never looked at paintings says, I don't know, it's, it could be a fake. Like, well, maybe, maybe, you know, but they're both giving us information about reality. Both those emotions, one of them is just an internal reality. Um, and you can rationally step back and say, well, the art experts, internal emotional evaluation probably needs to be taken more seriously than the, the other person's internal emotion, uh, with respect to art. Uh, so I don't, I don't actually, I don't actually view it as irrational to to appreciate waterfalls or art or say that there's some beauty that speaks to me. I I largely view this as a psychological phenomenon. Like this is something I like. Okay, no one can argue with that. Um, so I I just I guess that's the I don't I could there's like lots of things you said, but I'll just pick on that one and throw that out and see how you respond to that. Yeah, actually, I think I agree with you almost 100%. Because let's say that um, I take a art appreciation class, right? I mean, the, the purpose of the class is to teach me to appreciate art, right? So when I start that class, I don't actually appreciate art. I appreciate the appreciating of art, right? <laughs> and so the, the teacher has to transition me from appreciating, appreciating to actually appreciating. And and I guess the point I'm making is, is, yes, you use reason to do that. You can break down the paintings and talk about, you know, balance, the balance and the color matching and, you know, in, in, the, in the styles, the genres of the paintings and all of those things. All of that's absolutely necessary, right, to, to help me get to the point where I appreciate it. But at some point, all that has to come together, right? right? At some point, it's got to come together where I and, and maybe for the first time where I start to actually see the beauty in this art. And so, you know, from, of course, from my, uh, worldview, the, the notion of beauty, beauty within the Christian tradition really has this transcendental component to it, right? Like Roger Scruton used to like to say that beauty is a traveler from another world who bids you to come and visit. There is this transcendent like experience of wonder and awe that, that accompanies that, that, that experience of beauty. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think, in fact, you know, Jonathan Hyatt, um, that the um, wrote a very influential paper. That's essentially we're just we're we're we both agree we're Humean. I think uh, on this on this issue, David Hume. This is essentially his understanding of moral uh, judgment. And uh, um, but anyway, uh, Jonathan Hyatt's papers. The title of it is something like "The Emotional Dog Wags His." Um, what is it? The emotional dog wags his tail of reason or something like that. It, you know, that talks about this idea of motivated reasoning. And what he would say is it's really two parts is the, the worldview is part of it. Part of it is there's an innate sense, a uh, sort of an innate standard um, that we're born with. And I think that's that lines up with what Scripture teaches, this sort of the law of God written on your heart. Um, but then that is shaped significantly by the culture, right? The cultural complex, the, the social imaginary in, in every way. So your instincts are trained, right? You're trained to find something offensive or, or, or beautiful, both in a moral sense and in, in an aesthetic sense. Um, and I think that's actually what education is. This is, we've missed the boat big time. This is actually its purpose is to train the affections, right? It's to train people to love what is good and despise what is bad. And most people will say, well, that's just indoctrination. But I think you're actually engaging in that no matter what you do, right? You're, you're giving students a vision of the good life, no matter what, you know, even if you teach mathematics, there's a way to teach it that supports that particular vision. And so, um, but that's the point, right? So that, so that I don't have to reason through and try to figure out, you know, is this something that's good or not? It's the same thing with perception. Most of the time I look at a tree and I say tree, but I might look at some bush tree thing and I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And I have to deliberate, you know, 
go through a deliberation to figure it out. So, so here's where I can say there's some common ground, sort of. Uh, and I think you would call it uh, innate, maybe a Kantian uh, construction. I would just say biological, but I, I would say that, um, you know, as as an atheist who who does believe in the importance of philosophy, like atheism itself is is a a pretty useless thing. It's not a thing. It's just a, it's just a non belief, which doesn't you know it gets us a bunch of rioting Marxists running around the street. It's not it's not a helpful system, right? So if if you care about philosophy, you have to ask you have to ask the questions. Um, what is good and what is what, you know, how do I drive an ethical system? And I like to use, and this is one of the things that I appreciate the Bible. I think the Bible has, uh, through stories largely, but also just through outright stating, uh, has codified um, a set of moral principles that have, at the very least, even if you don't think, even if you're going to be cynical and say there's no such thing as good or bad, which I, I don't think is true, but e even if that's your stance, the Bible has codified those things and passed them down in a way that uh, comports with survival of that that belief system in that culture. Like it, it works. It's a it's a pragmatic working way to to run a society, even if that's all you're going with. And so, um, from a philosopher's perspective, I kind of look at those things and say, okay, well, there's a, those are like a sanity check. If you derive a moral system where murder's okay, uh that should give you a red flag because murder does not feel okay. Like murder is kind of culturally not okay. And there's scripture about it not being okay. There's almost every religion kind of not okay. We don't feel good about it. There is some sort of innate distaste for murder. So if, if your philosophy gets to that point, that's a red flag. You say, okay, you took a, you took a wrong turn in Albuquerque and you need to go back and find your errors because something's wrong with your philosophy. Um, so I guess, I guess, the, I guess in that sense, I'm, I'm kind of a, agreeing with you about kind of this innate, uh, I, I wouldn't say the innate feeling that murder is wrong necessarily makes it wrong philosophically, but it is a red flag that if your system has come up with murder being okay, you may want to re rethink your system. Yeah, I think that's right. I think absent some sort of, you know, I, I think absent God, right, some sort of objective ground for moral values and duties, um, it becomes much more difficult to say, you know, just across the board that these various virtues or virtues and vices are, are vices. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think I you think can do that right, though, right? Cause I, I think, I think you basically need to just say, if the standard is human life, Right. If the purpose of philosophy is, is teaching humans how to live on Earth and deriving ethics, like if your standard is human life, you can actually derive pretty clear rules that are that comport with Lockean natural rights, which were religion based, right, which were, were based on on an interpretation of scripture. You can kind of arrive at a very similar spot often. At least that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, we could uh, we could. I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, we could go I'm off on a tangent here, seeing, Terry. Sorry, I'm enjoying yeah, seeing you guys go back and forth. That's what you're saying. Um, I wanted to ask you about, like, kind of switch gears here for a second and ask you about the sermon that we're, and I think it applies to what we're talking about because when you're yeah. talking about appreciating the, the waterfall or the painting and that sense of awe, yeah. um, there was a sermon that you gave about about meaning and purpose. And I appreciate your comments at the beginning about how everyone needs meaning, but for some it's more acute and maybe that's my case as well. Um, but I reached a point in my life where suddenly meaning became very important, figuring out why we are here, all the big questions, you know, do we have a soul? Um, and, and so the, the, you gave this sermon about, it was almost, I guess, about, you know, what's the purpose of man or the meaning of man, I would say. And you walked us through a couple of different ways of looking at it. You know, is man a thinker or is man, I can't remember the other, you gave one, a believer, like a believer yeah. or a worshiper. Right. And I wonder if you could sort of lay that out. Uh, sure. Yeah. In fact, let me, um, let me lay a little bit of historical context down to, to sort of ramp up to that because there's, 
there's a couple of things I've been thinking about lately that I would love to run by you guys and, and, and see what you think concerning the current sort of uh, state that we're in or, or this, this new sort of radical shift that threatens to, to happen. Um, now, of course, everything I'm going to say is from a Christian point of view. So, um, but it, so it seems get ready, yeah. Carter. Yeah, get ready, Carter. Sorry. I, by the way, <laughs> just to be I clear, to... I'm really enjoying this discussion, and I'm I will actually I like arguing with you more than like I haven't been arguing with any Christians on the show, but I really appreciate the sincerity and intellectual uh, rigor you're bringing to the discussion. So I'm I'm enjoying it. I I, I will not uh, I'm not I'm not here to attack you. Okay. Okay. Um, you can, you can tell I have been attacked in the past, so I'm, I have a defensive posture ready to, uh, I don't want to uh, trigger you, right, or something. Um, so it, if we think about the idea of, um, you know, what, what the purpose of, of man is, you know, sort of the anthropological question of what is man? If you look throughout the history of Western civilization for the vast majority of time, man was viewed as essentially a teleological being, right? That he has an intrinsic essence, uh, or I, I should say an intrinsic um, purpose, that he has a telos, an end, to which he is, you know, to direct his life in which then, you know, it tells us who he is in his essence. Um, which is to say that there is a definitive answer to this anthropological question of, of what is man. For example, you can think of Aristotle, right? He has his famous four causes for for reasons why something comes to be, the efficient cause, the formal cause, material cause. But chief among them in Aristotle's mind is the final cause or the telos. And this is true of Aquinas, you know, that, you know, centuries later. But for a modern person, that's really, really odd. We tend to think of the purpose of something as being a consequence, right, as a result, not as a cause. But that wasn't the case for Aristotle, as I, as I said, that's kind of a new understanding of this idea of telos. Let me give you one other illustration from Aristotle. In his book, The Nicomachean Ethics, which is one of his texts on virtue, um, you could roughly get at what that book is about by saying that you essentially have man in his untutored state and man in his tutored state. And that what bridges the gap between those two things are, of course, the virtues. But man in his tutored state is really just man as he ought to be, acting as he ought to act, right? It's, it's man becoming fully human, which is to say that there is a vision, which the vision of the good life of eudaimonia, which is to govern and guide all of his behavior. There is some ultimate good that gives meaning and purpose to man's life. And Aristotle, of course, thought this was true of all living things, of plants, of the beasts, and, and of course, of man. And, you know, just to give a sense of how expansive this is, it's not just true in a, ancient Greece and in the West, but it's true in the ancient Near East, of course. You, you see it in the, the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, right, the book of Genesis. God creates the world, and he creates man in his image. There's this great creation myth, this primordial story about origins. And he places him in the garden, right? he, 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 and he tells him to cultivate the earth, which theologians refer to as the creation mandate or the cultural mandate, where God is a creator, man is created in God's image, so he's a sub-creator, and he's to take to take the raw materials of the world and make something new out of it. So he's to take sound and make music, he's to take grapes and make wine. It's part of this transition from good to very good. And you see it in ancient Babylonia. I mean, again, like all the way throughout history, you see this notion of the telos, as man's created for a particular purpose. And this holds sway until we get pretty late in modernity, right? Many people marking the transition out, of course, Friedrich Nietzsche and the death of God, which Nietzsche, of course, is notoriously hard to interpret. Every time I read him, I think he's actually saying something different than what he was saying. But how many people read Nietzsche was to say that this idea of an ultimate purpose, of ultimate meaning, of ultimate value, ultimate significance, absent God Absent that kind of transcendental anchor, just those concepts just drift away. And so there's a radical turn to the subjective, right? So then you have people like Jean-Paul Sartre who are saying that existence precedes essence, that we're essentially a blank slate and we get to decide what has meaning and purpose and value in our life. And I think this is made unassailable by 
the influence of French postmodernism, right, where it's a denial of every meta narrative. There's a collapse of the meta narrative entirely. Even the even apparently the neo Darwinian uh, narrative, and um, and and this is just the air that we've been breathing in for decades now, right? It's the hero's journey for in late modernity is what sociologist Robert Bella calls expressive individualism, right? What we're supposed to do is to look inside ourselves, right, and 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 look at these warring desires that are in there, and to choose among them which are authentic. Which, which are the ones that are the real me and which are the ones that are not authentic and, and not me. And then we're to have the courage to express those desires regardless of what, you know, family, culture, whoever uh, says about it. You know, Hermie the elf doesn't want to be an elf, right? He's looked inside <laughs> himself and he's realized, actually, I'm a dentist. And, you know, our, that's the hero's journey in every Disney movie, every animated movie in pop culture, right? Or at least it has been. And uh, it's, you know, the very height of villainy for society to say, actually, you're, a, you're an elf. You're not a dentist. Um, you know, you're a mermaid. You're not a human, right? So um, that's just the zeitgeist. It's the air we've been breathing. And, you know, so that brings us up to this contemporary moment. And this is where I'm really eager to hear what you guys have to think about this. Um, you know, as we, the social justice warrior you know, contemporary critical theory, whatever we want to call it, seems to be wanting to, threatening to making another dramatic shift in a radically different direction, it seems to me. And one of the interesting questions, one of the obvious questions, it seems, is why would people who are living in a thriving liberal democracy, right? Why would people who are living in Steven Pinker's enlightenment now, where they've never been wealthier, they've never been um, healthier, they've never lived longer, they've never had greater freedom in terms of negative freedom, freedom from restrictions. Why would people who are living at the very height of Western individualism find attractive this very restrictive form of collectivism, right? And the answer to the question, uh, it's complicated, right? It's complex. It has many moving pieces and many layers and there are different motivations for different people within the movement, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but it I have, a, I have a, a theory about a what I think is a piece of this. So I want to run it by you guys. And I'll try to do it quickly. Um, but I think Pinker's book points us to, to one, of the, one of the issues of why people would do this. Or maybe it's better to say the need for him to write the book points us in a direction towards something because the great irony of his book is that he had to write it right? right like if if life is this awesome you know if we're just killing it then you think the most obvious thing would be to say hey life is awesome like why would you write 550 pages to try to convince people that their life is really great you think that would be something that's obvious and no one would write that book there'd be no need for it and it wouldn't sell like it's selling and I think, you know, he gives some reasons why he thinks that's the case, that people don't have gratitude, that they don't know history, they're ignorant, so they don't realize how good they have it. And they're inundated by the media who keeps, you know, focuses on bad news because bad news sells. And so their picture is distorted. Um, and I think all those things are right. right. Those are all pieces in it. And there's many other pieces to, you know, the idea of resentment that people have failed in the meritocracy. And so now they're you know, resentful and they have that result them all. They want to, you know, take what other people have and they want to be on top without doing all the effort needed to get there. And, um, you know, and there's some intimidation, all this. So there's all these, these reasons, but what I'm wondering is maybe one of the more foundational issues has to do with the failure of this constructivist approach to identity formation, right? This idea of self identification, where I have to decide ultimate meaning, purpose, and value, uh, it seems to me is leading to some major onfectungans, some major uh, ang uh, anguish of the soul, right? It, in fact, I would say that it seems to me that it's, it's leading to an identity crisis. Are you guys familiar with John Verveke? I'm sure you are. John Verveke, the psychologist? I'm not. I'm psych not no. Psychologist? No. He talks about the crisis of meaning. So he's a cognitive scientist, and he's been 
charting this this meaning crisis he thinks that our Western culture is experiencing. He, the symbol that he uses are, is a zombie. He says we're like zombies in late modernity. And I think my understanding of sort of this identity crisis maps on to that, but also to what Hubert Dreyfus, the philosopher, calls the burden of choice. Okay, let me unpack that second one and if, if you guys, if I go on too much, you can just tell me to show. No, no, I'm, I'm loving repeat, this. Can you repeat the guy's name, the identity crisis guy? John Verveke. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I had his book. His book is something like Zombies in Western Culture. I love zombies, so this is right in my house. Well, and we've used zombies <laughs> as a, I mean, I think a lot of people intuitively use zombies yeah. as a way to describe what's happening. So it's a, it's something that I, that makes sense. Yeah. So the, so let me try to unpack this idea of the burden of choice. Okay, um, one of the part of the orthodoxy of late modernity is that uh, choice is always good. It's always better to have a choice than not have a choice. And a second sacred value, like it, is that it's always better to have more choices than less choices. And part of the reason why we exalt choice so much, it seems to me is because we tend to equate it with freedom, right? Which is to say that we tend to have a very thin view of freedom, which is just the negative kind of freedom, just the freedom from restrictions. The, the freedom to do whatever you want, it's, it's often that's, that, that exhausts our notion of freedom. That's what real freedom is about, the one worth dying for, and, and, and the one that's most connected to well-being, right? Which at first might make sense, um, which by the way, I've, I. I do attend quite a few of these rallies where people are, you know, you know, throw off the mask and, we, you know, we want our freedom and these are restrictions. And when I talk to people there, they tend to really focus upon just this one level of, of freedom. Um, but if you so you might think that's yeah, that's what freedom is about. But if you consider it for a little while, you say, no, actually, there has to be something more to it, because someone who has that kind of freedom could then use that freedom to choose to like smoke crack right, and become addicted to it, and their life falls apart completely, they become homeless. And nobody would look at a homeless crack addict and say, now that guy's free. Right? <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I, I, I would. Uh, oh, would yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me, okay, yeah, let because, me because I, I, freedom yeah, means right. fundamentally freedom from something. So you're, not, you're never free from the consequences of reality. Like he certainly has political freedom, but you are never free from the consequences of reality. Reality, and that's not a freedom you should strive to be to achieve because it's impossible and it leads to suffering. So uh, but, but reality I, requires responsibility and fidelity to it, not freedom from it. So can I say right, something? that's how yeah, I would view it. I would look at that guy and I would say, you pursued freedom to a place where you've ended up in a prison of your own making. You are a slave to your compulsions or your addictions right. and don't even realize it. And I think people can become imprisoned, but I was imprisoned by, by social justice ideology. My world had become so small and I didn't realize it. I didn't allow myself to read. I cut off entire avenues of thought. Um, I was a slave to my beliefs. And at times in my life, I've been a slave to other things that I felt like this is my freedom. It's my freedom to drink as much as I want. Okay, right. no, you're a slave to that drink. Um, and so I love this conversation about freedom. And I heard you give one of those speeches and you, and you talked about you talked about it. And the first time I had heard this concept, I think I've shared this with you before, Carter. I was blown away. I went to hear this guy speak um, and he was talking about. Augustine and he was saying and he was talking about the idea of freedom within boundaries and he sort of laid out this idea of you know we think tend to think of freedom in this modern culture as like Thumb and Louise like hitting the road the great outdoors it's always go 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 somewhere else freedom from right instead yeah. of freedom to I think was the way he put it but but he he someone someone made uh, an analogy in the Q&A portion of his talk they were talking about artists, to bring this back to art for a second, artists who learn technique and spend all this time learning boundaries and really mastering these boundaries and these, these skills. And then one, once you have that mastery and that knowledge, it really allows you to 
become so free within those boundaries to create the most beautiful works like that painting behind you, Bradley, the most beautiful detailed works of art um, versus the kind of freedom that you see in something like, like postmodern art where, and Carter's definitely heard this the last time I went to a postmodern art museum and it was a woman, her whole display was like stuffed animals where she pulled the stuffing out and set it on a pedestal. And I'm like, that's freedom. <laughs> that's not sure, art. Yeah. But that's yeah. not art. And that's you're not right. creating anything beautiful because you're not working with, you're so obsessed with not working in any boundaries that you're putting crap on a pedestal and telling me to appreciate it. So yes. I don't know if I'm making my point, but that, that yeah. I no, see that's that exactly guy. Right. I know what you're saying, Carter, but I also look at that guy and I say, that guy is not free. That guy is yeah. a slave. Sure, I think there's but, a second kind of freedom. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kurt. No, I, I, I just, uh, I don't like overloading terms and not being specific. Maybe this is just semantics, but uh, like, if you're going to paint good art, you're, you're not free to ignore the standards by which art is judged and humans have aesthetic appreciation. So like, that's ignoring reality. Like, so I, when we, when people value freedom, they value political freedom. They don't value freedom to like, uh, freedom to not believe in gravity, like sure, but we're not like, <laughs> you're free to not believe in gravity, but that doesn't make it good that you act on that. Like, so I, I guess I, I, I kind of see what you're saying. Cause there's a lot of people that use the word freedom as this floating abstraction and they're just raw, raw freedom in every possible sense. But I think the Western tradition is really specifically about political freedom, not the freedom to ignore reality and to be free from consequences of your actions. And that includes uh, the freedom to <laughs> ignore what's aesthetically, you know, the, the rules of art and make crap. Like, yeah, you can, but you've made crap. Uh, you can inject heroin into your arms, but you've imprisoned yourself and ruined your life. Like, I, I don't view those as, as, I don't, I don't, I don't think fundamentally the issue is freedom there. That's not, freedom's not a word worth talking about in those contexts, in my... I just, I opinion. disagree. Only, I'm sorry, Bradley, we're, now we're having, but just, I disagree only so, because I do see culturally that's the way in which I think people think of freedom. And if you think about, I mean, I know you and I both went down various paths, of maybe I would say mine was a search for meaning, I don't know about yours, but in the nihilistic kind of places that I was looking, there's this idea of just continually pushing the boundaries because it's almost like, like in, like in, like in the, um, these different types of sexual, you know, exploration communities and stuff like that, where people are continually trying to find the taboo they can break until they're getting to these really depraved places in this search of something that's freeing and meaningful to them. And they're never going to get there in my opinion, but it's this, this, the same thing. If you want to talk about hedonism, like we're like drugs or alcohol or whatever, this pursuit of, um, there's nothing off limits because this, this is freedom to pursue things to their end place and to keep going further without realizing that in going further, you've now enslaved yourself to something and maybe even the pursuit of all restraint of, of no restraints, you know, you're, you've, You've become so limited in what you can do. I, maybe we're saying the same thing. The, the reality of your, cons yeah, the consequences are that you, you're not able to do, you're not free to do anything in life because you're, you've attached yourself to that heroin needle or whatever, you know, like you're, yeah, you're, you're not saying free the same thing. It's, it's okay. just semantics at this point, I think. Then and <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll put a bow on this part by saying, okay. uh, freedom is not an absolute value at the at the top of the value hierarchy. It is a value in a specific context. Political freedom is valuable. Freedom abstractly generally is not a is that's not a value, right? So you're talking about like I should be free to do this and that and everything. Like like no, reality rules you. So like pretending that you have freedom to for example ignore gravity is not that's not a good thing. Freedom, the value of freedom comes in a very specific political context. And you're right that it is being applied generally to, I think I, I'm, I should be free to ignore the consequences of my actions, to ignore uh, the, the situation I'll get in if I start injecting heroin, to ignore the rules of art, to ignore like relationship consequences because of my sexual activity, like all of that stuff. And all of that is bad. Um, and I would argue that's a misapplication of freedom. So 
Sorry about all this. We'll go back. I'm sorry, Bradley. We'll no, return. Okay. This is a, a weird Bradley, tangent. Me, We're back. Let me throw some gasoline on this. Uh oh. Another way to think of it is it, it because I'm afraid to use the word freedom. Then that the freedom to kind a kind of freedom. Okay, this freedom to a higher level of being. Right. One of the paradoxes, and maybe this is maybe this is a problem, and we do need another word. Is it, it seems to create a paradox then because it seems to say that. This ultimate form of freedom is not a freedom from restrictions, but rather it's conformity to the right restrictions, right? There is a kind of conformity to the right restrictions, which leads to a higher level of, of being, right? Um, you know, the, the artist um, example, what, what's necessary, and in, 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 maybe think of it, well, I guess we could use the artist, but in order to get to the level where you can create art that's actually beautiful, right? You have to give up many lesser freedoms, right, in order to obtain the higher level of freedom. So, you, you know, you have to give up sleeping in and watching a lot of TV and, you know, hanging out with your friends and maybe playing sports because you'll break your hand or something. You know, I mean, all these freedoms over decades of time in order to, to attain this higher level of freedom. So, like you're saying, it's not an absolute value. I think the absolute value part is this higher level of being, this higher level of excellence, which I guess what I'm saying is an ex is an experience of freedom that you that there's so much richer and deeper and more satisfying than the lower, you know, kind of version of it. But what it tells us too is that another sacred value in late modernity is is this idea that you shouldn't conform to anything; that all conformity is bad, right? And so, um, you know, it, it just makes no sense if you think of you know the concert pianist who's who's spent the last thirty years practicing in order to get to the point where that person can fill in a, uh, you know, a concert hall with people paying 80 to a hundred dollars a pop to listen to the piano concerto, they've done nothing but conform. I mean, the whole thing is there's a very specific vision as to what a concert pianist is and a very specific vision as to what a beautiful concerto is. And they conform themselves exactly to that image as best they can. And it takes decades to do so. So it seems to be that, you know, this is this is one of the pushbacks I always get with regards to organized religion, like organized religion is nothing but restricting my freedom. Right. That, be, you know, like it says in the epistle of James, he refers to God's moral law as the law of liberty. Right. Well, to many late modern people, that, that's a contradiction. Right. You've got liberty on the one hand, which is no restrictions. And you've got law on the other hand, which is nothing but restrictions and no liberty. But the point he's making, and it's it's a point you see in literature everywhere up until real recently is the idea that if you conform yourself to this moral code, these moral laws, you will actually experience a greater level of being and you'll experience a greater level of freedom, right? So in the Christian ideas, you're conforming yourself to Christ and then you will be set free um, and experience freedom in a completely different and very satisfying and rich way. So it's, you know, this idea of God as the the cosmic buzz kill where all he just loves to ruin your good time by saying no 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 it's just restriction the idea is those no's are not no for no sake but there are no that's supposed to point you to a yes and the yes when you when you surrender to it is then you know it's going to lead to human flourishing is the idea um so let me transition then because i, I want to get back if i can to the um this idea of burden of burden of choice mm. Clay Rutledge, who is a um, behavioral uh, scientist, wrote a book in 2018, Supernatural. Are you guys familiar with this book, Supernatural? Man, I, I highly recommend it. Carter, no. I would be intrigued to know what you think of this book. Um, but he, as far as I know, I, I think he's an unbeliever, but um, he argues in the book that humans are a spiritual uh, yeah, spiritual species, which is to say that human beings have an innate, an innate need for the supernatural. And and it, it's tied into our need for meaning and the way we, we get that kind of meaning in the most robust sense is through this connection to the supernatural. And one of the things that he argues in there is that organized religion does a better job of tying people to this, you know, or satisfying this this need for the supernatural. And one of the reasons he gives for that is something he calls existential agency. Um, which what he means by that is that in a, in the modern world we have a we could think of 
existential choices that we have sort of in, in tiers, like first order choices and second order choices. The first order choices are what's going to give your life ultimate meaning and ultimate value and ultimate purpose, ultimate significance. And then on the second tier for modern people, we have a lot of other questions that more traditional cultures don't have, which are things like, who am I going to marry? What career am I going to go into? How many children am I going to have? All those kinds of questions. And what Rutledge says is it seems counterintuitive, but these organized religions actually, because, you know, they're often thought of as, you know, taking away agency, right, because of the restrictions. He says they actually provide that agency by, number one, giving you the answers to the top tier. Right. So you don't have to try to figure out some way to ground and, and figure out, you know, these really what, what I would think need to be objective sorts of answers to those questions. But even on the second tier, what organized religions do is give you a set of principles by which to, to, to guide you in making these kinds of decisions. And that actually creates in you the agency to, to make them. Because to go back to um, Hubert Dreyfus in this idea of the burden of choice is one of the things he notes is that that in contemporary culture and late modernity what one of the features of it is not just that now all of a sudden we have a lot of choices that they didn't used to have in traditional cultures but with that we seem to lack the criterion of judgment for making those choices or at least making them with any degree of confidence at all and that the choices people are making tend to be really bad choices which don't lead to real meaning and purpose and and so you know, I think that ties into the whole idea of an identity crisis. And so the idea is that um, you know an agency. I guess I'm defining agency the way a lot of philosophers do, which is to say it's not just the capacity, it's not just the opportunity to make a choice, right? That's not agency. What agency is is the ability to make a choice based on reasons, right? Because if it's just an arbitrary choice, you know, if somebody just comes up to me and says, you know, gives me a choice for something that's important, but I don't have, you know, the, the criterion of judgment to, to figure out which one is best. If it, if there's huge consequences for that choice, it's a huge burden on me now, right? It's no longer, you know, great to have a choice. I want to give that choice to someone who, who can make it for me that can actually do it in a way that's, it's reasonable, that can actually weigh, weigh these things. So it actually becomes a burden. So that's what he means by the burden of choice. He thinks that People in late modernity, in you know, in in real part due to this sort of constructivist approach to identity formation, are burdened with these choices, and so they're looking for a way out, right? They're looking for, you know, another worldview that could come along and say, "Listen, you don't have to make those choices, right? You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. That that's that burden upon you is is something you can't bear," and so. You can start to see that a, a collectivist, a hyper collectivist view that's going to tell you who you are and and, you know, and and here's 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 besides when you just tell me what you think of that in general. Here's where I really want your insight on this, because this is what confuses me about the current this this current ideology that's threatening or, or offering this this sort of collectivist view is, you know, you would think that if it is truly collectivist, that these identity markers would be set in stone. Right. And because they tend to be things that are immutable, your race, right, your age, your gender, your sexual orientation. Right. That makes sense. And so to someone who's having to choose it for themselves and they're looking despair in the face, having them chosen for them is great. Right. OK, I can I can. Now, this can become my whole identity. I'm a black lesbian female and that's who I really am. And I and I can be part of that group and have the group identity and, and all that stuff. You know, so that that makes sense. I can see that transition. I can see why all of a sudden that would become desirable. But what I don't understand is the movement seems to be almost incoherent because at the same time when there are some who are saying these things are immutable, you have a whole other group that are living in the past, if you will, and saying, actually, I get to choose who I am, right? I get to look inside myself and I might be a biological male, but I think I'm actually a female. And, and you know, which is to say that at least the Marxist influence of this, I don't see how that works with that kind of hyper individualism happening, right? You can't, you got to have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You can't have 65,000 versions of the bourgeoisie and 65,000 versions of the, you know, indefinite, not ending. That's like, they're trying to con 
put together individualism and collectivism into one yeah. package. And I mean, is that what you guys see? I mean, it seems so incoherent. I so we I, I'll say one quick thing about that because we talked about this very recently, Carter and I. They're now at a place where they're trying to say that what they're choosing is not what they're choosing, that it is immutable. So okay. it's so, for example, with the, with the, the idea that you can choose your own gender um, that or biological sex, which they're now pushing as well, you can choose your own biological sex. Right. They they originally it started with. Well, first of all, they, they, they separated the two and they said biology is innate and gender is what is socially constructed. And so we're not attacking biology, which is saying you can choose your own gender. Well, now they've moved on to biology. And so what they're doing is they originally were saying, you know, you should respect people's preferred pronouns. And if you don't, you're a bigot. Okay, now they don't, they're moving to a place, I don't know if you've heard this yet, they don't like you using the phrase prefer, preferred pronoun because preferred implies choice. Right. And 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 yeah. means that it's yeah. not innate. And so now they've moved to a place of no, if I say that I am a man, I'm not choosing that. That's who I am innately, and you should recognize that innately I am a man. I'm discovering it. I'm not that, creating it. I'm discovering it. I'm discovering it. Yeah. that truth yeah, that about myself. Yeah. And so now we're we're gonna to get to a place very soon. They've just started doing this, I believe, but it it's starting to catch on, I think. Within a year or two, they will not be using. They have to catch up, right? So, but the, the the people who create the tenets of this belief system have now introduced the idea that it's offensive to say preferred pronouns because then you're implying that it's a choice, whereas this person is just discovering this innate truth about themselves. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Crazy, and it's also that's why they really hate the um, the people who are now detransitioning, and a lot of them are women who, you know, late set, late onset, what do they call it, Carter? Late yeah, onset gender, gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria, yeah. Yeah, so, the, yeah. so a lot of the sort of, I call them the trans trenders, now that it's become trendy and people who are deciding that they're transgender who may have in the past before this became a cultural phenomenon would never have even gone down that road are now deciding they're trans and then a few years later deciding they're not and they want to transition back to being a biological female with, you know, their, their, um, innate identity, but they, they are being told by the very same community that said, you must always validate if a person says they're trans, if a child says they're trans, they're trans, no questions asked. Don't try and explore any other reasons. They're trans. Now those people say to them, you were never trans. <laughs> If you yeah. go back, then you were never trans. Isn't yeah, that see, amazing? That, that's amazing. And it's I think that's so dangerous because for many reasons. But what that tells me is, is that the more Marxist collectivist side is winning, like it's going to eat the other side. Because I thought maybe, you know, it, you have these two sides in conflict with one another. It could be, although I have issues with that kind of hyper individualism, I think ultimately it's, um, you know, it can't be sustained. I was kind of hoping maybe that in time they would you know, choose it, but it may be because of this burden of choice and other reasons that the collectivist view is going to win out. You were hoping that the postmodernism would cause the collectivism to unravel, maybe. Yeah, sort of. Or I, I just I'm, – I'm more concerned – I mean it's crazy to say because I used to be really concerned about postmodernism, but I'm more concerned with this sort of Marxist – collectivist, you know, the ridding of human agency and human dignity and respect, as far as an eminent danger, that to me seems, you know, obviously much worse. Um, it may burn out faster, which is not to say that I love postmodernism. I don't, right? Like, but I was kind of hoping that what we've been experiencing the last four, four decades or so was going to win out in the end and we'd kind of be where we were. Um, but if, you know, if, if at least part of what I've said is true, then it makes sense that we might be at the breaking point where people are done with it. They're done with that kind of hyper individualism and, uh, they're ready to throw it away. So, or at least some people are anyway. What do you think, Carter? I know I kind of monopolized that. Uh, <laughs> man, there's a lot here, guys. Uh, I, uh, my brain is not smart enough to remember everything, uh, all the threads I want to pull, but, uh, Let's step back and and do this. 
Uh, I don't, I, so I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. And uh, the, 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 the first helpful conclusion now that I came to was stop trying to view it as, you said it was an incoherent belief system. It, it is not a belief system. Um, that's why it's an incoherent belief system because you think it's a belief system, but it's not. It's a psychological really? manifestation. That's you're you're viewing you're viewing psychological dysfunction on a mass scale. You're not viewing a belief system where there is internal agreement and consistency among groups. That's not what's happening. Um, there's a shared psychological dysfunction, and they have a shared enemy, and that enemy is specifically <laughs> white Western Christian straight men and everything that they represent, right? It's, it's, it's the Western culture, right? That's their enemy. And so but I identify as a black, <laughs> right? And, you know, well, so, so I'm, that's not, I can group. explain I why you can't do that though, <laughs> right? That's why you, yeah. that's actually why you can't do that. So if you look at, if you look at, um, uh, critical theory and, and the roots of critical theory, which got applied to race and you have critical race theory, if you look at the evolution of that, um, they explicitly reject postmodernism. They explicitly reject uh, constructivism. They are anti anti essentialists, right? So the postmoderns were the anti essentialists. The the critical race theorists explicitly say we are anti anti essentialists, um, and the reason for that is they recognize that you sh if they don't do that, right? If they don't embrace critical theory. And but they go with postmodernism. You, Bradley, will be able to say I identify as. Blah, blah, blah. They can't have that, right? Right. right? That's, that doesn't meet their political ends. Um, so, but on the other side, you have the postmoderns, and largely manifest in in the trans stuff is is the greatest kind of example of of the postmodern deconstructionism. But you have to remember about the postmoderns, like postmodernism itself doesn't believe that actually there is an objective reality. So. They can sit around and say gobbledygook all day and it doesn't matter because there's no – it doesn't comport with reality. It doesn't have to correspond to reality in any way. Um, so I actually think that the preferred pronouns thing, what's happened with the postmodernism is they've they've tried to now apply it to reality clearly. Um, and so I don't – postmodernism wouldn't use the word preferred either. That's my pronoun because the utterance of me saying that's my pronoun makes it so. Reality isn't my – I'm not – I'm like not expressing a preference for objective reality. I'm, I'm st there is no objective reality. So if I, if I say my pronoun is, uh, his majesty, that is, that is reality that I've just made it. So that's postmodernism. I've made it. So by, by the, by virtue of my utterance, it is now true. So I don't actually see, I still see two parts to this. I don't see postmodernism falling apart like Carrie does. And she's saying like, you were thinking like they're going more kind of Marxist. I don't see them doing that. I see them. That's just a, a more strict uh, and more uh, more honest application of postmodernism. Like, no, 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 no. It's not a preferred pronoun. Reality doesn't actually exist until I mention what my pronoun is. And, and, and if I'm not trans now, then I was never trans. Like, and if I'm trans now, then I was always trans. Like it, it doesn't, that's how reality works for postmoderns. So I, I I don't think you have a, a unified philosophic enemy. What you have is, um, you brought this up earlier, right? You have nihilism. We tore down the church, like pretty severely. We tore down religion. We tore down meaning in people's lives. We replaced it with absolutely nothing. We replaced it with subjective, like the kind of freedom that we were arguing about earlier. Like, yeah. It, you know, party all night, inject heroin, screw screw rules for painting, do whatever you want, right? We we replaced we replaced the uh, two things the the moral boundaries that religion offered us, and and we've gone and we've replaced literally the the reality boundaries. Like we're rejecting science because we don't like it because it says two genders. We've we're we're literally rejecting everything. Um, and we've replaced it with nothing. The, the atheists, the, the atheists to, uh, and, and they get full responsibility for this. They argued that God doesn't exist, convinced a bunch of people, and then said, my job's done. Uh, enjoy your hedonism and walked away. <laughs> like, right. okay, you assholes. 
Like, you just ruined civilization. Like, you can't do that. You need to, you need to replace, you need, people do need rules. They do need to understand why moral rules are in place. And there, there does need to be constraints in society. And they're just, they were just removed um, completely. And then the postmodernists came along and removed even the, the boundaries that reality would have given them on a very obvious level. Like, hey, uh, you're a woman. Well, that's not even true anymore either. So I, I view this whole thing, I, for, for me, the easiest way to view it is uh, this is psychological. This is uh, people who have um, a psychological need to tear down something in their life. It's not always just resentment of whatever, but like there's a there's psychological trauma and there's a psychological need to uh, A, fit in with the people around them as largely a thing, right? They need to feel morally good. And so virtue signaling does that and posting on Facebook does that. And they need to, and they, they have kind of this, this bitter angst because they don't have meaning. They don't know where the rules are coming from. Uh, and and they do need constraint. And, you know, you mentioned burden of choice. There have been UI, UX designers know this. There's been studies done about this. It turns out, just, just a aside, and then I'll shut up. It turns out that uh, actually infinite choice is not helpful. Um, if you if you give someone, I, the study they did, I don't remember what food it was, but we'll say it was chocolates. I don't, I don't remember. You go into a chocolate shop, you give people six options, right? They can they can pretty easily choose six options. They'll buy they'll buy a couple. They'll be happy. They'll leave. You expand it to thirty six <laughs> options, and they'll come in and they'll have analysis paralysis. They'll buy less. They'll take longer, and like it actually destroys the interface between the store and the person because they don't know what to do. Um, so and this is you know it probably has something to do with your intellectual crow, like how much you can hold in your memory at any given time. Uh, I'm not sure why, but a actually. Unlimited choice, while I do believe politically is uh, value, like political freedom is valuable. You should have politically not be limited. Nevertheless, uh, having limitations based on something is kind of a necessary thing if you don't want to just be a suffering neurotic in, in the corner and not know what to do. I'll, I know that you, was a long. You just answer. helped me understand why, when I was pescatarian, it was so much easier to order at restaurants. I felt so confident about what right, I wanted. There's like two things, <laughs> yeah. and now I eat all kinds of meat, and I can never decide. <laughs> it's crippling. Right. It, it reminds me of I. I remember the first time I went into a Gap. I guess before this, I'm not big into buying clothes. I don't. I'm not heavily invested in. I don't really know what I'm doing. My wife buys all my clothes now, but. I guess before that, I was going shopping somewhere where you'd have two or three, ver you know, styles of khaki pants to pick from. And I remember going into a Gap, and there were like thirty-five. There was like a wall of khaki pants, <laughs> and I just walked out. I could not deal with it because I, yes. again, I didn't have the criterion for judging like the difference between them. And so, if somebody would have come up to me and say, "Listen, I'm a fashion person. I can I can look at you and pick out which one is best for you. You know, the right pair for you," I would have taken that offer and said, "Absolutely." Right. I, I don't I, I'm on, I don't have the agency to, to make this kind of choice. And so I'm going to now. But who cares about pants? I mean, you know, you buy a bad pair of pants, you don't wear them again. You know, that goes up significantly if these are these choices are consequential. If they have to do with real meaning, purpose and value. Right. Let me ask you this, because um, another thing I see, because my my sense is that we really have. I mean, this is this is not just my thinking, but it seems and I'm not a historian, so I could make an argument for this, but it seems to me that for any culture that's going to be successful, you have to maintain, and for lack of a better word, sort of the communitas aspect of it in individualism, right? You, you, um, that every thriving culture has both of these because these are human needs. We have a need for community. We have a need, you know, to be treated with dignity and respect and agency and all of that. And that some cultures lean a little more one way or another, right? Traditional cultures tended to lean, the good ones tended to lean more towards collectivism. You know, their sort of hero's journey was the idea of self-denial, of sublimating your own interests for the good of the community, right? You can think of like Aeneas and the Aeneid kind of thing. The, the idea of pietas, right? Duty to, to, to your country. Um, and more modern cultures have tended to lean more towards the individualism side, you know, guaranteeing rights for individuals and guaranteeing dignity and, and those kinds of things. So I think you can lean 
either way and still be prosperous. It seems to me, and I guess this is obvious, but the problem is come is, comes when you go extreme, right? The extreme collectivism that we've seen in the 20th century, right? That um, really didn't end well, where, where you lose human dignity and you lose um, human you know, individual's agency. And, and you know, so you can kill 6 million people and it doesn't really matter because it's all about the good of the collective, whatever that means in the utopian vision. But I think it's also true that if you go too far into individualism, and I think that's where we're we're finding ourselves, right? Not just in the sense of I got to choose my own identity, kind of hyper individualism, but in the sense of, and, and I think this is where John Verveke goes with it, this idea of zombies is our idea of communitas has just shrunk down to almost nothing, right? We, uh, and technology has permitted this. I think there's a inherent narcissism to people that given the opportunity, I'd rather be by myself or with just a few a few relationships, right? There's, there seems to be that as technology has made it possible for us to further and further isolate ourselves, we've done so, right? And that, you know, if you think of zombies, I guess, they have a community sort of, but they're just sort of standing around in a dark corner waiting for the sun to go down. You know, they're, they're not really interacting with each other a whole lot. <laughs> they're waiting for a wrong think tweet. Yeah. <laughs> to go eat. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it seems, it seems like that, you know, we, we're moving further and further away. It's sort of the atomization of our society, right? And and the whole promise of the digital social element that that will solve all the problems turns out to be, I think, for the most part, a, a bust. Um, and, you know, so I guess my sense is that that, that component of it too, the, the, the community has to, the com- community part has to be restored also. We've got to figure out a way that yes. you can't do it online. You have to uh, get in communities. And, and if you think about meaning, purpose, and value, right? I mean, if you want your life to be significant, I mean, as it's often been said, then, you know, join a community, take on responsibility, because, you know, a relationship is not going to be non-conditional, right? They're going to become dependent on you. You're dependent on them. And that gives you a sense of responsibility and purpose and significance. Um, so I think that's another Another piece of this that's missing that might make what you would call a psychological manifestation, but, you know, that might make this other view more appealing because there's, you know, a sense of community and fellowship where we chant together and we march together and we burn down churches and buildings together. And I mean, it seems twisted, uh, but, you know, they, they recite the creed, you know, all these sorts of religious rituals that are part of being a religious community. Yeah is our needs that human beings have. And, um, you know, if you're going to woo this crowd back, I think you're going to have to give them a better way, as you were saying, to, to tie into the, that kind of deeper meaning. And also you're going to have to get them to, you know, be, give them, offer them a community. Which, yes. by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Christianity say, has both those things. But Christian- <laughs> <laughs> We do those pretty well. I like that. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely when I was in social justice, one of the things it offered me was a sense of community. I fully recognize that looking back. And I used, to, but it still wasn't fulfilling in the way, I, even when, it's funny, I used to, I remember myself saying as an agnostic that the only thing I missed about the church was the natural springboard for activism that it provided in some ways, like for doing things in the world. And, and the sense of community. And so I was always looking to fill those things with this belief system. Um, but you were also making me think of this piece that Carter and I talked to, we dissected this piece uh, a while ago. It, it was, it's called the nuclear family was a mistake it, by David Brooks in the Atlantic. And we thought we were going to have a lot of issues with this piece based on the title. But what he actually went to argue was that the nuclear family was too small of a unit that we were evolved and that that it was natural for us to live in a broader community with extended family members and other trusted people that, that reducing ourselves to these small units was the beginning of something that has, has now, I would say evolved into what you're talking about where it's even smaller. It's like maybe you and your dog. That's like me. It's me and my dog and my internet. (laughs) 
and yeah, it's just, absolutely. you know, your uh, zombies is a, is a great analogy for it. I do think maybe it's that we've reached a place where we've become so disconnected from community that this, this uh, really stringent form of collectivism is appealing because it's all about, you know, the, a large amount of people. It's all about looking out for the little guy and you feel like you're a part of this, this group and not just a group. It doesn't just offer community. It gives you this sense of moral righteousness that you're doing the right thing, that you're looking out for these groups, these oppressed groups. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling now, but you should push back on a couple things. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, one I want to push back on is I'm not I'm not convinced that technology has only isolated us. It's easy to say that, but it also I have a we have a community of twenty six thousand people right now that uh, and you know not all of them are in our chat. So let's let's say there's a few thousand who are kind of regulars. I wouldn't know any of those people, and I've made friends and like uh, we have shared values, and all none of that would be possible. I'm isolated here in California, surrounded by people from you know. Berkeley and and um, I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who don't share my values at all and will probably burn me at the stake. But I have a I have a community that it only exists because of technology. So I don't disagree. And I'll say I'm here in Denver today. Right. I don't know when this will air. And one of my has become one of my very good lady friends is here, and I met her online. Right. So that that's just a minor thing I want to. But I I, I do get. I do get some of the negative consequences of technology. The other thing that I just want to push back on is uh, I I feel like the words individualism, collectivism, and community are used in very sloppily generally. I'm not saying you specifically, but I, I just, I want to, individualism, like the value of individualism is the ethical, the philosophical ethical value, it, like individualism as an ethic. It's individualist ethics that are, that, um, that have been responsible for the the um, prospering of the West. Like when you say like, oh, but they both prospered. Like, uh, no, I would rather live now than uh, in ancient Greece. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like, I think we've prospered much more now. Our life expectancies are much longer. Our standards of living are much higher. And, and that's largely due to the individualist ethic. It's largely due to um, trying to apply the individualist ethic to uh, political society and unleashing people's potential be- because they had the not to use this word again because they had the freedom to 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 go do what they needed to do. But I like, but individualism to me doesn't mean like I don't view I don't view postmodernists as hyper individualists. Like individual again, individualism <laughs> individualism is just an ethic. It doesn't mean uh it doesn't mean you like. It's not solipsism. Individualism isn't solipsism. It's it's not like I, I get to construct whatever I want because I want it. That's not individualism. Um, so like and, and when I'm pushing back on collectivism, collectivism is the subordination of individuals ethically to to the group. And individualism is the primacy of individuals ethically to the, the, the group. I think you can have community without collectivism. So I do I do think community is important, but how we've modeled, at least when we've done it well in modern society, how we've modeled community through individualist uh, ethics is voluntary cooperation among people. It's voluntary communities. And um, the, I, I think what we're seeing now is that the political system can't maintain harmony if the culture and philosophy is corrupt and fallen apart. And so I don't have a lot of there's not a lot to complain about with the i for me for with a with a political idea of how we've tried to implement individualism kind of we we haven't done it well but at least it's talked about properly in the founding documents of America it's a, it's a kind of a clear philosophical principles that if we implement them things kind of go well the problem is uh we live in a culture full of nihilists and narcissists and like I the the politics won't fix our culture and our philosophy and so I feel like we're kind of we can't blame the the political individualism for the problems that we have today because we like that that only lasts so long as the culture and the philosophy uh 
buttress it. Like they need to support it. Those are the foundations for our culture. And so it doesn't matter what's written on pieces of paper. If we're going to be a bunch of Marxists at heart or nihilists, we're going to burn our cities down and ignore the paper and do a whole bunch of bad things and nothing matters, right? It doesn't matter what's written in the Bible if no one read if if you call yourself a Christian but you never read the Bible and you just you're just a slipsist and do what you want and burn things and beat people like, well, you can call yourself that, but what's written in the Bible is irrelevant and I kind of because you're not reading it, right? I'm not saying you, but like it's a, that's kind of a similar analogy of like, okay, well, yeah, these these ideas were enshrined in in maybe our constitution and declaration of independence, but no one Hey, that's not, we don't live our lives that way. So, uh, th does that make sense? Yeah. Especially that last part, I totally agree with you is that people tend to think that, uh, the constitution, um, lays out for us, you know, a, a totally, a total ethical system rather than just a set of principles that have to govern it. Right. So, um, if the ethics of the community shift, the Constitution, there's no way to protect that, right? right? I mean, if we start to adopt a bunch of radical, immoral beliefs, they can keep the Constitution all great, and they can enshrine it, and you know, and and view it, you know, with it, it can, it still can function as as it as, as it functions. But I think in you find this in the founding fathers, they said, listen, if you get rid of the ethical system, um, this is worthless. I mean, it's not gonna, it's 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 not gonna guarantee. What they understood to be, you know, creating a, a prosperous community. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it's and again, I would recommend in a, in a very broad sense, the Christian ethical system is the as the, <laughs> as the broad foundation from which you don't say. Do. Yeah. I mean, I know huh. it's just shocking for me to suggest something <laughs> like that, but I think it's a good one in a general sense, not like mandatory, you know, um, adherence to uh, my particular form right. of Christianity or anything, but yeah. You know, I was thinking earlier, uh, Carter has a friend who's atheist who would like to believe, you know, when you were talking early, Bradley, about oh. you ask people, would you like to believe? Right. And she is trying. And maybe I think you could have a, I don't know, maybe, I think there's going to be a growing number of people of atheists who want to believe and are yeah. open to um, like hearing from, I don't know, I'm just, I, it just struck me. I was like, there's there's a need out there. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I, I really identify with that, I guess, because that was sort of my own story, right? I really, I really did desire to have this kind of deep meaning. And so I was primed, you know, to, to accept it when I found it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, how... It's actually a very interesting philosophical question, which is to say, how do you get someone to value something, right? How do you get them, not in the way of, you know, we, as I was saying, you use reason and you break down all the parts and all that, but how do you get them to see the painting, see the beauty in it, right? I mean, it, there seems to be a, a step there that's missing of, I show you all the reasons why you should value it, and you know that, that you, you know, but to actually see the beauty of it is another step and so it's 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 a sort of a, a mental project of mine is to to think about that particular subject and and to be honest i think the sacraments are designed to help in that right the sort these sort of because we're dealing with the, i think the imagination at that point so the story and symbol and metaphor the, that's the kind of language of the imagination or what cs lewis called the poetic imagination so it seems to me that the sacraments, what they are, at least in part, are these participatory metaphors, right? You're, is you, you gather around the Lord's Supper. It's not something where you're just checking a box and saying, God's happy with me because I took, you know, I took the wafer and, and, and took a little, little sippy cup of juice, which, by the way, that, that to me seems very, I mean, it's supposed to represent the feast of the lamb, right, in the new heavens and the new earth. And we got a little sippy cup of juice. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, Hey, maybe I'd go to church if they served a giant goblet of wine and a steak. That would be. That's what uh, I'm saying. It's a feast. It's supposed to be a feast, right? So, <laughs> I, you know, I think the emblems have value, but we 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 tend to do the bare minimum, I guess, because we're trying to check a box. But it's supposed to be that you're participating now in this this feast that is to come, right? Baptism is a is a participation. It's a burial in water, and then being raised up again. You know, if somebody dunks you underwater and brings you back up, you have this kind of feeling of of, you know, death of, of being buried. 
And so that's supposed to communicate to you on another level, not through reason, but through imagination and experience, the kind of rebirth that's taking place in your soul and that one day will take place when, when all people are raised from the dead. And so, you know, that's sort of within the, the practices of the church. Those are, I think, two ways in which you can start to have someone see the value of it rather than just appreciate it from the outside. And I would like to think that preaching is like that too. But, you know, having said all this, if you listen to my sermons, I'm like as Western as you can be. I'm just like, it's all reason. And, you know, I'm up there (laughs) and and, and I'm trying to move away from that. But that, to be honest, that's sort of my default. That's, that's, you know, if, if you would play this video for, for me, me 10 years ago, I'd be like, who is that person? I I can't identify with them at all in, in a sense, because, you know, I, my default is much more on the you know, on the reason side, but anyway, I, that's I think why I important. think you um, are. I think you have a voice that atheists who want to believe can hear, and I, so. I think that's very valuable. And yeah. you know, you have a, a very you you speak to the mind as well as the heart, which is you know a talent. So we got to get Carter to want to believe it. Now that's what we're going to work on. <laughs> we're going to want. See the value in it. See, Carter well, you know, it's it's interesting because you said that earlier. Like atheists will say to you, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he said they, I don't care if I believe or don't want believe. Like, I, I do agree. Something I agree with you about is I think it is a very important question. And one thing that bothers me is Christians who claim to believe but don't really behave as if it has any significance in their life. Because I take, I don't believe it because I take it seriously, um, and. That's it's a serious claim and it would have serious consequences. Um, and I don't really say I don't want to believe, I just say, uh, I want to believe what's true. That's what I want to believe. So I don't know if it's true, then I guess I want to believe it. If it's not, I don't. I don't have that's what I would mean. And I think that's what a lot of atheists mean by like, I don't have a horse in the race. Like, I don't, I it is a significant decision, it is consequential. But I only want to believe it if it's true, because if it's not true, then it's negatively consequential. So, like, right. the consequences go both ways. Yeah. Well, and I I think there might be two two things that are there, because if you think about, again, if somebody says to you, you know, do you want it to be true that you have terminal cancer right now? You're going to say no. Why? Because those are major consequences. And, and in your view, it would be negative ones. Right. right. It, it can it really, I think, is similar if we're talking about you know, the Jesus that's talked about in the Bible is that there's massive consequences. And, and, and you might be in a position which, you know, I, there, there might be some sort of close to middle ground where you're like, you know, I'm, I, you know, but it seems to me that people either would like that idea of it being true, or people would, would not like the idea of it, of it being true, uh, because the consequences are so huge. So, um, but yeah, I mean, e- either way, I think it's, <laughs> I, I mean, it I, helps your case to convince someone of its value before you get too deep into the arguments. Because, I mean, I, just in my own experience, people just, you know, s- suppress arguments like crazy. And here, and maybe I could say this because I think this is important, um, is I don't really blame them entirely when they do that initially, right? Because we're talking about things that are going to radically change their worldview. And when you think about how worldview functions, is it really makes us feel at home in the world. It makes sense of all this data that's coming in that it would just, without a world, you'd be total chaos, right? You couldn't make sense of anything that you're supposed to do or, or understand anything. So, um, you know, one writer describes when you, when your worldview is attacked and, and, and you start to realize, oh, it doesn't map onto reality anymore as a domicide, like it's a destruction of your home. It's, it's a very disorienting experience where you feel homeless, right? Yes. And I've, I've actually Absolutely. changed my worldview twice. So I know how – it's the most traumatic thing I've ever been through. I'm sure there's more traumatic things than this. But it was very traumatic because it was changing how I looked at reality. And so I don't really – I mean I know Paul talks about suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And I think there is a point where you know, it becomes plain to you that this is true and you just don't want it to be true and you're just gritting your teeth and saying, I, you know, I – I, I hate this. I don't want it to be true. But I'm understanding that when people are resistant to, to, to evidence, because, you know, this if you're asking me to abandon my view of reality, 
it's going to take more than 0.6 on the probability scale in your argument to get me to do it, right? I mean, you, you got to really give me lots of reasons to, to make that kind of leap. And you need to give me an alternative vision that I think is better, right? I'm going to cling to this worldview because it's the only thing I got. If you're not offering me something better, then what am I going to do? I can't go out in this, you know, it's a no man's land with no worldview and everything becomes totally meaningless. So I think we tend to cling to that worldview un until, you know, somebody offers us another one. So again, it's kind of like if I offer you one that answers those questions better than the one you have and you're starting to see there's problems with yours, then there's a the potential for someone to shift. So, That's yeah. And, and I think they've done me. studies. I've, Go ahead, Carrie. I, it's absolutely what happened to me is that I, if you think of your worldview as a house, I think George Lakoff is the one I first read talk about it in this way. Um, that if you think of your worldview, the, the, your belief system, whatever, as a house, it's like raising your whole house to the ground. That's why so many people who are in it, it, when we talk about trying to reach people who are in the social justice faith, which Carter doesn't care about as much as I do. He's, <laughs> he's like, you make me sound so evil. I'm done with them. No, it's yeah. not that I don't no, care about them. I just don't think no. they're the ones who can be saved. Like you, I don't, you know, I know you do care about them. Bad about the about, pastors, which he's done. But you don't care <clears> about <throat> trying. Carter says it's like the house is on fire and he's trying to dig a moat around the house and I'm going into the house to get people, which right. is true. <laughs> I, I think digging the moat is very important. And so I don't, you know, yeah. I, I completely get that. You, where your priority lies and who you're talking to, who the audi yeah. intended audience is. That's what I would say. But but so when I think about part of my audience is people who believe what I used to believe. And I have to remind myself of that a lot because one of my challenges, one of my struggles is not having empathy for people who believe what I used to believe. And so I have to keep reminding myself that I want those people to hear me and, you know, try and appeal to them. But I, but I get why it's so hard for them to hear facts that contradict with the, the belief system. Um, they dismiss them because it's not like just changing a window on your house of belief. It is like raising the whole house to the ground. That's really hard. Like you said, it leaves you homeless. It left me homeless. I was in the most vulnerable, darkest place of my life. That's what, that's what happened to me. And, yeah. Yeah. uh, I, completely started, okay, let me build my foundation from the ground up and figure out what it is I think I believe. And you're, that's asking people to do a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it reminded me when you said that you have a tendency to look back at people who believe your old ideology and, you know, sort of look down your nose at them or get frustrated with them. That's a very common thing that people do, right? When we change our mind, even on a particular issue, it's like part of human nature where we want to then become self-righteous and yeah. chastise everybody that believed what we believed five minutes ago or believes everything, something we believed five minutes ago. So <clears throat> I know that's a, something you have to resist and fight against constantly. That's my continual struggle, one of them. Yeah. Well, and you know, as far as I get frustrated with people, obviously, too, and frustrated with bad arguments and all those things. But, you know, it, an advantage I have as a Christian is, is I, you know, I do have this ethical system which says that I have to love everyone, right? I have to love my enemies, which may seem like a total burden, right? That you have to, you know, fight through that frustration and the, and the feeling of just saying, I'm done with this, you know, let them burn their own house down. Um, you have to push past that. But I think that, again, that's not, not a restriction for restriction's sake, not just there to torture you, but you can actually come out the other side when you, when you really follow those instructions, which I don't always, unfortunately, but I try to yeah. is, is it really is a higher level of being loving people is actually, you know, better than, than hating them, I think. So, yes. You know. And it's very, uh, <clears throat> I was reading C.S. Lewis, who said that loving people, we've talked about this before Carter and I, about loving people that you like is very easy, right? but loving people you don't like is hard. And I think you can love people you don't like. It's just, you, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I disagree, but I know we have to right end, Carrie, so I'm going to bite my tongue and not say all the things that I want to say right now and but let you have the last good. say. Thank you. The last thing I'd like to say is that, Bradley, we would love to have you back on the show another time. Right. To I'd love to do it. And yeah. um, I thank you very much for coming on and giving us, giving us your time and, and your mind you. and your heart. And uh, I'm so glad you guys finally met. So. Yeah, yeah, it was absolutely. great. I I could keep 
I could keep talking to you for uh, another two hours, but uh, yeah, me too. On. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, guys, thanks so much. Here's Thank you. I really enjoyed it. So, and again, if people want to follow you online, they can go to Church on the Square on Facebook and YouTube, and we will put the links in the description. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Please avoid any contact with these individuals. I have calculated a 94.9% .9 chance that their ideas are more contagious than COVID. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Remain calm. The new group of nine people will enforce the Constitution just as well as all previous sets of nine people have done. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.